part four section fifteen of the freedom of the will by jonathan edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain appendix section fifteen containing remarks on the essays on the principles of morality and natural religion in a letter to a minister of the church of scotland reverend sir the intimations you have given me of the use which has by some been made of what i have written on the freedom of the will etc to vindicate what is said on the subject of liberty and necessity by the author of the essays on the principles of morality and natural religion has occasioned my reading this author's essay on that subject with particular care and attention and i think it must be evident to every one that has read both his essay and my inquiry that our schemes are exceedingly different from each other the wide difference appears particularly in the following things this author supposes that such a necessity takes place with respect to all men's actions as is inconsistent with liberty and plainly denies that men have any liberty in acting thus page one sixty eight after he had been speaking of the necessity of our determinations as connected with motives he concludes with saying in short if motives are not under our power or direction which is confessedly the fact we can at bottom have no liberty whereas i have abundantly expressed it as my mind that man in his moral actions has true liberty and that the moral necessity which universally takes place is not in the least inconsistent with anything that is properly called liberty and with the utmost liberty that can be desired or that can possibly exist or be conceived of i find that some are apt to think that in that kind of moral necessity of men's volitions which i suppose to be universal at least some degree of liberty denied that though it be true i allow a sort of liberty yet those who maintain a self-determining power in the will and a liberty of contingence and indifference hold a higher sort of freedom than i do but i think this is certainly a great mistake liberty as i have explained it is the power opportunity or advantage that any one has to do as he pleases or conducting himself in any respect according to his pleasure without considering how his pleasure comes to be as it is it is demonstrable and i think has been demonstrated that no necessity of men's volitions that i maintain is inconsistent with this liberty and i think it is impossible for any one to rise higher in his conceptions of liberty than this if any imagine they desire and that they conceive of a higher and greater liberty than this they are deceived and delude themselves with confused ambiguous words instead of ideas if any one should hear say yes i conceive of a freedom above and beyond the liberty a man has of conducting himself in any respect as he pleases if he is a liberty of choosing as he pleases such an one if he reflected would either blush or laugh at his own proposal for is not choosing as he pleases conducting himself in some respect according to his pleasure and still without determining how he came by that pleasure if he says yes i came by that pleasure by my own choice if he be a man of common sense by this time he will see his own absurdity for he must needs see that his notion or conception even of this liberty does not contain any judgment or conception how he comes by that choice which first determines his pleasure or which originally fixed his own will respecting the affair or if any shall say that a man exercises liberty in this even in determining his own choice but not as he pleases or not in consequence of any choice preference or inclination of his own but by a determination arising contingently out of a state of absolute indifference this is not rising higher in his conception of liberty as such a determination of the will would not be a voluntary determination of it surely he that places liberty in a power of doing something not according to his own choice or from his choice has not a higher notion of it than he that places it in doing as he pleases or acting from his own election if there were a power in the mind to determine itself but not by its choice or according to its pleasure what advantage would it give and what liberty worth contending for would be exercised in it therefore no armenian pelagian or epicurean can rise higher in his conceptions of liberty than the notion of it which i have explained which notion is perfectly consistent with the whole of that necessity of men's actions which i suppose takes place and i scruple not to say it is beyond all their wits to invent a higher notion or form a higher imagination of liberty let them talk of sovereignty of the will self-determining power self-motion self-direction arbitrary decision liberty and ultra mevis power of choosing differently in given cases etc etc as long as they will it is apparent that these men in their strenuous dispute about these things aim at they know not what 
fighting for something they have no conception of substituting a number of confused unmeaning words instead of things and instead of thoughts they may be challenged clearly to explain what they would have but they never can answer the challenge the author of the essays through his whole essay on liberty and necessity goes on the supposition that in order to the being of real liberty a man must have a freedom that is opposed to moral necessity and yet he supposes page one seventy five that such a liberty must signify a power in the mind of acting without and against motives a power of acting without any view purpose or design and even of acting in contradiction to our own desires and aversions and to all our principles of action and is an absurdity altogether inconsistent with a rational nature now who ever imagines such a liberty as this a higher sort or degree of freedom than a liberty of following one's own views and purposes and acting agreeably to his own inclinations and passions who will ever reasonably suppose that a liberty which is an absurdity altogether inconsistent with a rational nature is above that which is consistent with the nature of a rational intelligent designing agent the author of the essay seems to suppose such a necessity to take place as is inconsistent with some supposable power of arbitrary choice or that there is some liberty conceivable whereby men's own actions might be more properly in their power and by which events might be more dependent on ourselves contrary to what i suppose to be evident in my inquiry what way can be imagined of our actions being more in our power from ourselves or dependent on ourselves than their being from our power to fulfil our own choice to act from our own inclination pursue our own views and execute our own designs certainly to be able to act thus is as properly having our actions in our power and dependent on ourselves as a being liable to be the subject of acts and events contingently and fortuitously without desire view purpose or design or any principle of action within ourselves as we must be according to this author's own declared sense if our actions are performed with that liberty that is opposed to moral necessity this author seems everywhere to suppose that necessity most properly so called attends all men's actions and that the terms necessary unavoidable impossible etc are equally applicable to the case of moral and natural necessity in page one seventy three he says the idea of necessary and unavoidable equally agrees both to moral and physical necessity and in page one eighty four all things that fall out in the natural and moral world are alike necessary page one seventy four this inclination and choice is unavoidable caused or occasioned by the prevailing motive in this lies the necessity of our actions that in such circumstances it was impossible we could act otherwise he often expresses himself in like manner elsewhere speaking in strong terms of men's actions as unavoidable what they cannot forbear having no power over their own actions the order of them being unalterably fixed and inseparably linked together etc on the contrary i have largely declared that the connection between antecedent things and consequent ones which takes place with regard to the acts of men's wills which is called moral necessity is called by the name of necessity improperly and that all such terms as must cannot impossible unable irresistible unavoidable invincible etc when applied here are not applied in their proper signification and are either used nonsensically and with perfect insignificance or in a sense quite diverse from their original and proper meaning and their use in common speech and that such a necessity as attends the acts of men's will is more properly called certainty than necessity it being no other than the certain connection between the subject and predicate of the proposition which affirms their existence agreeably to what is observed in my inquiry i think it is evidently owing to a strong prejudice arising from an insensible habitual perversion and misapplication of such like terms as necessary impossible unable unavoidable invincible etc that they are ready to think that to suppose a certain connection of men's volitions without any foregoing motives or inclinations or any preceding moral influence whatsoever is truly improperly to suppose a strong irrefragable chain of causes and effects as stand in the way and makes utterly vain apposite desires and endeavours like immovable and impenetrable mountains of brass and impedes our liberty like walls of adamant gates of brass and bars of iron whereas all such representations suggest ideas as far from the truth as the east is from the west nothing that i maintain supposes that men are at all hindered by any fatal necessity from doing and even willing and choosing as they please with full freedom yea with the highest degree of liberty that ever was thought of or that ever could possibly enter into the heart of any man to conceive i know it is in vain to endeavour to make some persons believe this or at least fully and steadily to believe it 
for it be demonstrated to them still the old prejudice remains which has been long fixed by the use of the terms necessary must cannot impossible etc the association with these terms of certain ideas inconsistent with liberty is not broken and the judgment is powerfully warped by it as a thing that has been long bent and grown stiff if it be straightened will return to its former curvity again and again the author of the essays most manifestly supposes that if men had the truth concerning the real necessity of all their actions clearly in view they would not appear to themselves or one another as at all praiseworthy or culpable or under any moral obligation or accountable for their actions which supposes that men are not to be blamed or praised for any of their actions and are not under any obligations nor are truly accountable for anything they do by reason of this necessity which is very contrary to what i have endeavoured to prove throughout the third part of my inquiry i humbly conceive it is there shown that this is so far from the truth that the moral necessity of men's actions which truly take place is requisite to the being of virtue and vice or anything praiseworthy or culpable but the liberty of indifference and contingent which is advanced in opposition to that necessity is inconsistent with the being of these as it would suppose that men are not determined in what they do by any virtuous or vicious principles nor act from any motives intentions or aims whatsoever or have any end either good or bad in acting and is it not remarkable that this author should suppose that in order to men's actions truly having any desert they must be performed without any view purpose design or desire or any principle of action or anything agreeable to a rational nature as it will appear that he does if we compare pages two o six two o seven with page one seventy five the author of the essay supposes that god has deeply implanted in man's nature a strong and invincible apprehension or feeling as he calls it of a liberty and contingence of his own actions opposite to that necessity which truly attends them and which in truth does not agree with real fact is not agreeable to strict philosophic truth is contradictory to the truth of things and which truth contradicts not tallying with the real plan and that therefore such feelings are deceitful and are in reality of the delusive kind he speaks of them as a wise delusion as nice artificial feelings merely that conscience may have a commanding power meaning plainly that these feelings are a cunning artifice of the author of nature to make men believe they are free when they are not he supposes that by these feelings the moral world has a disguised appearance etc he supposes that all self-approbation and all remorse of conscience all commendation or condemnation of ourselves or others all sense of desert and all that is connected with this way of thinking all the ideas which at present are suggested by the words ought should arise from this delusion and would entirely vanish without it all which is very contrary to what i had abundantly insisted on and endeavoured to demonstrate in my inquiry and where i have largely shown that it is agreeable to the natural sense of mankind that the moral necessity or certainty that attends men's actions is consistent with praise and blame reward and punishment and that it is agreeable to our natural notions that moral evil with its desert of dislike and abhorrence and all its other ill deservings consists in a certain deformity in the nature of the dispositions and acts of the heart and not in the evil of something else diverse from these supposed to be their cause or occasion i might well ask here whether any one is to be found in the world of mankind who is conscious to a sense or feeling naturally and deeply rooted in his mind that in order to a man's performing any action that is praiseworthy or blameworthy he must exercise a liberty that implies and signifies a power of acting without any motive view design desire or principle of action for such a liberty this author supposes that must be which is opposed to moral necessity as i have already observed supposing a man should actually do good independent of desire aim inducement principle or end is it a dictate of invincible natural sense that his act is more meritorious or praiseworthy than if he had performed it for some good end and had been governed in it by good principles and motives and so i might ask on the contrary with respect to evil actions the author of the essay supposes that the liberty without necessity of which we have a natural feeling implies contingence and speaking of this contingence he sometimes calls it by the name of chance and it is evident that his notion of it or rather what he says about it implies things happening loosely fortuitously by accident and without a cause now i conceive the slightest reflection may be sufficient to satisfy any one that such a contingence of men's actions according to our natural sense is so far from being essential to the morality or merit of those actions that it would destroy it and that on the contrary the dependence of our actions on such causes as inward inclinations incitements and ends is essential to the being of it natural sense teaches men when they see anything done by others of a good or evil tendency to inquire what their intention was what principles and views they were moved by in order to judge how far they are to be justified or condemned 
and not to determine that in order to their being approved or blamed at all the action must be performed altogether fortuitously proceeding from nothing arising from no cause concerning this matter i have fully expressed my mind in the inquiry if the liberty of which we have a natural sense as necessary to desert consists in the mind's self-determination without being determined by a previous inclination or motive then indifference is essential to it yea absolute indifference as is observed in my inquiry but men naturally have no notion of any such liberty as this as essential to the morality or the merit of their actions but on the contrary such a liberty if it were possible would be inconsistent with our natural notions of desert as is largely shown in the inquiry if it be agreeable to natural sense that men must be indifferent in determining their own actions then according to the same the more they are determined by inclination either good or bad the less they have of desert the more good actions are performed from good disposition the less praiseworthy and the more evil deeds are from evil dispositions the less culpable and in general the more men's actions are from their hearts the less they are to be commended or condemned which all must know is very contrary to natural sense moral necessity is owing to the power and government of the inclination of the heart either habitual or occasional excited by motive but according to natural and common sense the more a man does anything with full inclination of heart the more is it to be charged to his account for his condemnation if it be an ill action and the more to be ascribed to him for his praise if it be good if the mind were determined to evil actions by contingents from a state of indifference then either there would be no fault in them or else the fault would be in being so perfectly indifferent that the mind was equally liable to a bad or good determination and if this indifference be liberty then the very essence of the blame or fault would lie in the liberty itself or the wickedness would primarily and summarily lie in being a free agent if there were no fault in being indifferent then there would be no fault in the determination being agreeable to such a state of indifference that is there could be no fault found that opposite determinations actually happen to take place indifferently sometimes good and sometimes bad as contingent governs and decides and if it be a fault to be indifferent to good and evil then such indifference is no indifference to good and evil but is a determination to evil or to a fault and such an indifferent disposition would be an evil disposition tendency or determination of mind so inconsistent are these notions of liberty as essential to praise or blame the author of the essay supposes men's natural delusive sense of uh, liberty can, of contingence to be in truth the foundation of all the labor care and industry of mankind and that if man's practical ideas had been formed on the plan of universal necessity the ignawa ratio the inactive doctrine of the stoics would have followed and that there would have been no room for forethought about futurity or any sort of industry and care plainly implying that in this case men would see and know that all their industry and care signified nothing was in vain and to no purpose or of no benefit events being fixed in an irrefragable chain and not at all depending on their care and endeavor as he explains himself particularly in the instance of men's use of means to prolong life not only very contrary to what i largely maintained in my inquiry but also very inconsistently with his own scheme and what he supposes of the ends for which god has so deeply implanted this deceitful feeling in man's nature in which he manifestly supposes men's care and industry not to be in vain and of no benefit but of great use yea of absolute necessity in order to their obtaining the most important ends and necessary purposes of human life and to fulfil the ends of action to the best advantage as he largely declares now how shall these things be reconciled that if men had a clear view of real truth they would see that there was no room for their care and industry because they would see it to be in vain and of no benefit and yet that god by having a clear view of real truth sees their being excited to care and industry will be of excellent use to mankind and greatly for the benefit of the world yea absolutely necessary in order to it and that therefore the great wisdom and goodness of god to men appears in artfully contriving to put them on care and industry for their good which good could not be attained without them and yet both these things are maintained at once and in the same sentences and words by this author the very reason he gives why god has put this deceitful feeling into men contradicts and destroys itself that god in his great goodness to men gave them such a deceitful feeling because it was very useful and necessary for them and greatly for their benefit or excites them to care and industry for their own good which care and industry is useful and necessary to that end and yet the very thing for which is a reason this great benefit of care and industry is given is god's deceiving men in this very point and making them think their care and industry to be of great benefit to them when indeed it is of none at all and if they saw the real truth they would see all their endeavors to be wholly useless that there was no room for them and that the event does not at all depend upon them 
and besides what this author says plainly implies as appears by what has been already observed that it is necessary men should be deceived by being made to believe that future events are contingent and their own future actions free with such a freedom as signifies that their actions are not the fruit of their own desires or designs but altogether contingent fortuitous and without a cause but how should a notion of liberty consisting in accident or loose chance encourage care and industry i should think it would rather entirely discourage everything of this nature for surely if our actions do not depend on our desires and designs then they do not depend on our endeavours flowing from our desires and designs this author himself seems to suppose that if men had indeed such a liberty of contingence it would render all endeavours to determine or move men's future volitions in vain he says that in this case to exhort to instruct to promise or to threaten would be to no purpose why because as he himself gives the reason then our will would be capricious and arbitrary and we should be thrown loose to altogether and our arbitrary power could do us good or ill only by accident but if such a loose fortuitous state would render vain others endeavours upon us for the same reason would it make useless our endeavours on ourselves for events that are truly contingent and accidental and altogether loose from and independent of all foregoing causes are independent on every foregoing cause within ourselves as well as in others i suppose that it is so far from being true that our minds are naturally possessed with a notion of such liberty as this so strongly that it is impossible to root it out that indeed men have no such notion of liberty at all and that it is utterly impossible by any means whatsoever to implant or introduce such a notion into the mind as no such notions as imply self-contradiction and self-abolition can subsist in the mind as i have shown in my inquiry i think a mature sensible consideration of the matter is sufficient to satisfy any one that even the greatest and most learned advocates themselves for liberty of indifference and self-determination have no such notion and that indeed they mean something wholly inconsistent with and directly subversive of what they strenuously affirm and earnestly contend for by a man having a power of determining his own will they plainly mean the power of determining his will as he pleases or as he chooses which supposes that the mind has a choice prior to its going about to confirm any action or determination to it and if they mean that they determine even the original or prime choice by their own pleasure or choice as the thing that causes and directs it i scruple not most boldly to affirm that they speak they know not what and that of which they have no manner of idea because no such contradictory notion can come into or have a moment's subsistence in the mind of any man living as an original or first choice being caused or brought into being by choice after all they say they have no higher or other conception of liberty than that vulgar notion of it which i contend for these a man's having power or opportunity to do as he chooses or if they had a notion that every act of choice was determined by choice yet it would destroy their notion of the contingents of choice for then no one act of choice would arise contingently or from a state of indifference but every individual act in all the series would arise from foregoing bias or preference and from a cause predetermining and fixing its existence which introduces at once such a chain of causes and effects each preceding link decisively fixing the following as they would by all means avoid and such kind of delusion and self-contradiction as this does not arise in men's minds by nature it is not owing to any natural feeling which god has strongly fixed in the mind and nature of man but to false philosophy and strong prejudice from a deceitful abuse of words it is artificial not in the sense of the author of the essay supposing it to be a deceitful artifice of god but artificial as opposed to natural and as owing to an artificial deceitful management of terms to darken and confound the mind men have no such thing when they first begin to exercise reason but must have a great deal of time to blind themselves with metaphysical confusion before they can embrace and rest in such definitions of liberty as are given and imagine they understand them on the whole i humbly conceive that whosoever will give himself the trouble of weighing what i have offered to consideration in my inquiry must be sensible that such a moral necessity of men's actions as i maintain is not at all inconsistent with any liberty that any creature has or can have as a free accountable moral agent and subject of moral government and that this moral necessity is so far from being inconsistent with praise and blame and the benefit and use of men's own care and labour that on the contrary it implies the very ground and reason why men's actions are to be ascribed to them as their own in such a manner as to infer desert praise and blame approbation and remorse of conscience reward and punishment and that it establishes the moral system of the universe and god's moral government in every respect with the proper use of motives exhortations commands counsels promises and threatenings and the use and benefit of endeavours care and industry there is therefore no need that the strict philosophic truth should be at all concealed 
nor is there any danger in contemplation and profound discovery in these things so far from this that the truth in this matter is of vast importance and extremely needful to be known and the more clearly and perfectly the real fact is known and the more constantly it is in view the better more particularly that the clear and full knowledge of that which is the true system of the universe in these respects would greatly establish the doctrines which teach the true christian scheme of divine administration in the city of god and the gospel of jesus christ in its most important articles indeed these things never can be well established and the opposite error so subversive of the whole gospel which at this day so greatly and generally prevail be well confuted or the arguments by which they are maintained answered till these points are settled while this is not done it is to me beyond doubt that the friends of those great gospel truths will but poorly maintain their controversy with the adversaries of those truths they will be obliged often to shuffle hide and turn their backs and the latter will have a strong fort from whence they never can be driven and weapons to use from which those whom they oppose will find no shield to screen themselves and they will always puzzle confound and keep under the friends of sound doctrine and glory and vaunt themselves in their advantage over them and carry their affairs with a high hand as they have done already for a long time past i conclude sir with asking your pardon for troubling you with so much in vindication of myself from the imputation of advancing a scheme of necessity like that of the author of the essays on the principles of morality and natural religion considering that what i have said is not only in vindication of myself but as i think of the most important articles of moral philosophy and religion i trust in what i know of your candour that you will excuse your obliged friend and brother j edwards stockbridge july twenty fifth seventeen fifty seven end of part four section fifteen end of the freedom